Welcome, guys, to a solitaire wargame review with theplayersaid.com. I'm Grant. Today, I am going to talk to you about my thoughts uh, regarding Gato Leader, The Battle for the Pacific, which is a solitaire only game in the Leader series from Dan Verson Games. I uh, received this a couple of months ago. I am currently in the middle of my fourth campaign. I did a couple of very short ones. I did one really long one, and now I'm in the middle of a medium one, uh, just trying out some different things still. But I feel like I've played enough that I can give you my thoughts on the game. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a spoiler. I really enjoy the Leader series. I find their structure and their layout to be very easy to play. I think the rules are very simple to pick up. The rule book, which is what you're looking at here, is very well written. There are always some points where I'm like, I wish I had a little more clarification, but that's when I go to BGG or other sources and I can typically find another piece of information that helps me. But I really like the structure, the flow, and the setup of the game. I feel like the um, sequence of play is very good. I feel like it's very, it makes a lot of sense very logical, it flows well, and progresses. I also feel like while any game that is new, it takes it, it takes you some time to kind of get used to the system, but I really feel like in Gato Leader, once I was done with my very first encounter with a convoy and went through the process of firing my torpedoes, moving, doing things like lag movement, uh, the escorts doing detection and then attacking me, man, I felt like the rest of it was very intuitive and I felt like I had picked it up. So really enjoy this game. Once again, I'm giving you a spoiler. I do like this game. Um, I have played Sherman Leader. Alexander with the blog has played several others, Phantom Leader, um, Thunderbolt Apache Leader, and uh, we really enjoy the leader series games. So Gato Leader, what is it? Well, one other thing that I like about this game really quickly before I go on is a lot of times it's really hard for me to be the bad guys. And let me couch that statement by saying, I understand that in war games, somebody's got to play the Americans or the British, and then somebody's got to play the Japanese or the Germans. I understand that. It's part of the game. In these solo games, I have a little more trouble when I'm playing the Germans versus when I'm playing the Americans or the British. So for instance, if you watched my review on Sherman Leader, I really enjoyed Sherman Leader because I was the Americans fighting the Germans and the Japanese. Didn't have any concern about me being the other side. So I was rooting against them. I was trying to defeat them. And that comes from my bias, obviously, as, as an American. Um, so Gato Leader is a follow-up to U-Boat Leader. U-Boat Leader came out, I want to say 2014. Gato Leader came out in 2016. U-Boat Leader obviously is the vaunted U-Boats in the North Atlantic uh, during World War II, while the Gato Leader focuses on the Americans in the Pacific Theater of Operations uh, fighting against the Japanese. So... I struggle with being the bad guy, so I'm going to say that straight up. I've been interested in Sherman, or not Sherman Leader, I'm sorry, Tiger Leader and U-Boat Leader, but I have not been able to work myself up to, to getting those. But in Gato Leader, you are a submarine uh, squadron commander, and you are sending out either one or multiple submarines, sending them out into... Uh, into various campaigns. Here's a look at the setup. We'll go over this a little bit. But sending them out into the various campaigns, you will notice the campaign I have here is in 1943. There are campaigns in 1942, 43, 44, and then 44 and 45. So there are four different campaigns that are playable. The real difference in the campaigns are where you are based from. In this 1943 campaign called Turning the Tide, You'll notice if you look here, operations from Australia and Pearl Harbor. Um, the first one in 1942 is called Against the Sun, 
and you are uh, out of Pearl Harbor, right after the dastardly attack by the Empire of Japan. The submarine base escaped damage, and that's when that campaign, campaign starts. So each campaign, a little bit different, a little bit focused in different areas. And the big difference between campaigns is what boats are actually available. And what I mean by that, I'm going to show you... I'm going to show you the stack of submarines really quickly so that you understand what, I, what it is that I'm talking about. One of the other things I really like about these DVG Leader Series games is the variety. This is the stack of playable submarines that you have at your disposal. So you'll notice these are cards. There are two cards for each submarine, and I've got these listed here. Let me just show you really quickly. I bumped the camera. So this is the Tautog commanded by Lieutenant Commander William Siegliff. It's a Tambor class. And why I br bring up the campaigns is you'll notice here it says December of 41 through August of 45. That means this sub is available for all of the campaigns in the game. December 41 through August of 45. And I've got them sorted that way. So let me go ahead and, and find one. Here, I'll show you the, uh, the Tang. The USS Tang reminds me of the mixed orange drink that I drank when I was a kid. So the Tang, you'll notice, is available in January of 44 through August of 45. So that means if I'm playing this 1943 campaign, I cannot choose the Tang as my submarine or one of my submarines. It simply doesn't exist yet and it, it's not in service. So the reason they do that is... Technology improved over the war um, in the early campaigns, 1942-1943. The torpedoes were unreliable at best. They didn't arm themselves. They wouldn't explode upon impact all the time, and they didn't run, run uh, correctly. But as the war progressed, that technology improved, and those uh, torpedoes became more and more accurate. So that's kind of reflected in the different, what is called special option point values on the different submarines. That's another thing I, I want to show you there. You'll notice this, the Tautog, is an ace level, and it costs 15 special operations points for you to buy this. So that's going to be a very expensive boat for you to buy and start your campaign with. More often than not, you're going to be buying a green, you'll see SO points of four, or you're going to be more often than not buying a trained which is six, and you can buy three or four trained and have several submarines to try and meet the requirements of each campaign. So that's a look at the, but look at the different subs. I mean, there are all types of different classes, Gato class, Tambor class, um, Trench, Tench class, Baleo class. They just, they have all the different types of submarines that were represented in the U.S. fleet during World War II. So lots of variety. So that's a quick look at, at the subs. So once again, back to the campaign, and I'm gonna actually turn, turn this a little bit. What you'll see here is this is the, the different lengths of the campaign. So what you're going to do is you're going to choose a campaign, you're then going to choose a length, and the length is nothing more than the timer for the game. So if you choose the short campaign, you're going to have only one patrol per sub. Medium is two patrols per sub, and the long is four patrols per sub. And what is a patrol defined as? It simply is defined as a sub leaving port, moving around this strategic map through various areas, encountering uh, convoys and escorts, doing battle, taking damage, running through events, etc., they may run through two, maybe three areas, and then eventually they're going to have a lot of stress. They're going to have a lot of damage. They're going to be out of ammunition for their gun and out of torpedoes, and they will have to then return to one of these ports. So when they come back to a port, that is the end of one patrol. So you can see the game can vary. A short patrol, if you have one or two subs, you might be done in an hour. If you have two or three subs with two patrols, it might take you two hours. And, and that will be dependent on what type of, of uh, events you get and then what type of, of uh, convoys you encounter. The long you may end up spending two and a half to three hours. 
The one long campaign I did, that was my third try. I think it took me about five hours over three or four days, and I would play 20 to 30 minutes at a time. I'd seem to be busy at that time, and then went on. But you'll also notice in the different campaigns, they will give you what is called your special option points limitation. So in a short campaign, in this, uh, on this campaign, the 1943 Turning the Tide, you're going to start with 40 SO points. You're going to use those SO points, remember, to buy submarines. And remember that SO point value is listed here. So you might potentially be able to buy three to five submarines. I like to keep it to a reasonable or manageable number, three or four. If I have four, I can actually form a couple of wolf packs. We'll talk a little bit about that. And that's a good thing because the subs work together and you're able to destroy a lot more shipping as well as escorts. But you're going to have to pick your points to buy these subs. And then you'll notice, so let me go ahead and uh, just let you focus here. I'm going to go ahead and just grab one that I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up this or I would show you. Here's another campaign map. You'll notice there are special option notes, and these are different options that you can buy for a certain number of special option points that can be used throughout the campaign to give you advantages. For instance, an intelligence uh, counter. It's unlimited. You means you can buy it as many times as you possibly can over the, over the course of a campaign. Sometimes you're going to get new SO points from events. That's about the only time. I think I've received three or four in a campaign. It doesn't happen often. Uh, but you also notice you can do a mine special attack. You can do a, a special attack on a specific area. An FOB is a forward operating base. A forward operating base is a base that you place out in the middle of one of these areas. It has to have an FOB box. And it, in essence, acts as a port but does not count against your patrol ending. You can reduce stress at that port. You can also reload on uh, torpedoes. And they will actually have listed, for instance, this FOB says remove two stress and you can reload six total torpedoes. So you might give one sub two or three, take the couple of stress, and then leave the other two or three for your other subs that are out there. But you can see there's all different types of things. There's radar, torpedo modifications, something that I highly recommend. You can also use your SO, SO points to do R&R, &R, which is to remove stress. Very important. Stress will be the one thing that ends up killing you more often than not. And not killing you necessarily, but allowing you not to do anything for a turn. If you become unfit, which means you're going over your maximum stress value. Let me show you this. So here you can see stress, and they have it listed. 0 to 4 or 5 to 6. As long as you have 0 to 4, you're in the OK status you're going to get some different advantages. Torpedo skill, plus one. Evasion is going to be two. Your gunnery skill is plus zero. If you happen to get five to six stress, you're going to become shaken, and you'll notice your skills go down as well as your evasion. If you ever, with this sub, go over six, you're going to be called unfit. When you are unfit, you are directed to move to the searched box of the location that you are at, and that ends your turn. I can tell you there always seems to be one sub in any game that just tends to draw bad events over and over again, get hit with a big stress hit, and they, they can't do much. And it's just that's just the way it is. So you got to expect that. You got to plan for that. And you got to be ready for it. But that shows you how you're going to outfit uh, your, your different submarines. I'm going to tell you this is the part of the game that I think that I enjoy the most. And I think that I enjoy it the most because you are making such critical decisions at the very beginning of the game that are going to affect you throughout your entire play. And, and that's, some, that's a big ask. And I'll be honest, the very first time I played, had I not played Sherman Leader in the past, I would have had a real difficult time, probably not done well. I actually won my first campaign uh, with an adequate result. But that's something you're going to learn over time. You're going to learn what you're going to need. You're going to learn what works best. You're going to learn what different subs and their abilities mean and how you can better use them. But it, it really is a key and meaningful decision at the very beginning of the game. 
Now, I will say about Gato Leader, not only do you have key and meaningful decisions at the very beginning, you also have meaningful decisions throughout each, each game. And I'll talk a little bit about this, but there's going to be many, many times that you have multiple contacts in a certain C zone. You might have two or three contacts that you've found. You're going to go into the first one. You're going to kill one or two ships. You may decide that, hey, you're taking a little damage. You're going to leave. That's a decision. You're going to decide, am I going to take off, live to fight another day, remove your temporary damage, and then get right back at it and either attack that convoy again or go on to the next convoy to try to do some damage. And there's been times where I've had maybe a, a contact left over, but something went so poorly during that first convoy I attacked that I had to ask myself, Grant, is this submarine going to last? Am I going to do any meaningful damage? Or is it just, forgive my expression, peeing in the wind? So I love that fact. I also love the fact that there are multiple options that you can have each time you contact convoys. You can go submerged, you can surface, you can shoot your deck gun when you're surfaced, you can shoot torpedoes and your deck gun at the same time when you're surfaced. You've got to play a hide and seek with the escorts. Some of them are very powerful. There are some that are naval escorts and you'll get those based on the card draws you have. Man, you want to stay away from those and there's a lot of great decisions. There's decisions about what special actions you take when you are targeted or when you are attacked. I'm going to show you really quickly a couple of counters and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about this later. Um, but here's an example of a counter deep dive. When you are targeted, you can decide that I'm going to deep dive, crash dive. You're going to dive to try to avoid that attack. You're going to take some stress. The ship normally doesn't have to, your enemy ships don't roll to hit you. If they're in the same area, they're going to hit you. But when you deep dive, they have to roll under your or over your evasion to hit you. So that's an interesting choice. Another inter interesting choice is, do I want to do silent running where I'm more hard to detect? Uh, let's say I'm damaged and I want to hide out and allow some of the stronger naval units to move ahead of me. There's a thing called lag movement where slower ships are going to lag behind the main convoy. So you might decide, I'm going to silent run. You'll notice the speed is zero. You're not going to be able to move, but you're going to be able to position yourself such that you can potentially pick off a straggler that you may uh, be able to take out without the fear of getting attacked. So there are a lot of choices like that. And I really like this game for that very reason. More so than Sherman Leader, I enjoyed Sherman Leader, but I felt like there weren't as many meaningful choices. I also really like the AI in this game. We'll talk a little bit about that. I think I keep saying that. But looking at the uh, strategic map here, I'm going to move over, move my video over just a little bit. One thing you will notice is that uh, each area is specifically named. This is the Philippine Sea, the South China Sea, the Caroline Islands, the Marianas, the Bonans, etc. And then you've got your different ports. You're going to move through these areas and you'll notice that there's several red counters on here. What that means is in each of those sea zones, I have made contact in the past and everybody's a little more wary when I go into those areas. Therefore, it's a little harder uh, for me to make contact with a new convoy. You'll notice it says warning negative two contact. So let's talk about contact. So when you move into a sea zone, really quickly, when a submarine moves into a sea zone, they are either patrolling or they are moving. When you're moving into a new zone, you're considered to be moving. You are going to draw, in this case, one event card in the Caroline Islands. Some others might have two event cards, I've seen as high as three, here you go in the East China Sea. But you're gonna to have to pull those event cards. If you stay in the same zone and you decide to patrol, you're gonna to have to pull a certain amount of cards. In this instance, it's two. And let me show you what event cards are. So event cards, you're literally going to draw that number of events and they have either a negative uh, reaction, a positive benefit or neutral. So this is a bad one. And I'm going to I'm going to tell you there's about 60% that seem to be bad in my opinion, maybe 65%. 
This one says equipment malfunction. You're simply going to add three stress points to that submarine. That's not good. Here's another one, Ultra Intercept. This is a good one. You're going to add a plus one to contact rolls in this campaign map zone for this submarine for this turn only. So if you pull that event, you're going to put an Ultra counter, which is right here. You're just going to do that. You're going to place that in that area, and when you get around to doing contact rolls, you're going to add that as a die roll modifier to that, to that number. So back to the events. So there's a good one. There's another equipment malfunction, two stress points. This is one of the bad ones. Enemy contact. You're going to roll a die and add your evasion rating and check for the result. One to four, a submarine, your submarine is sunk. Five to nine, you're going to take a heavy hit. Ten plus, a light hit. Modified by plus one if the submarine has radar. Um, you also notice it says 1944 and on. It's a lone merchant. Expend one torpedo to gain one victory point. So that's a bad one, but it has a benefit if it's 1944 or 1945. Here's a good one, morale boost. Uh, you gain two stress. You remove two stress. Here's another one, fatal error. If you are, you're going to, based on your experience level, Green trained veteran or ace, those are the four levels of experience. You're going to roll a 10 sided die. If you are shaken or unfit, roll a die and compare to sub's experience level. So if I'm green and I roll a five, I'm sunk. Veteran, you can see it's a little harder to do, but that's bad. I have never actually had a submarine sink on these, but I can tell you they're very bad. This is a good one emergency repairs, remove one lasting damage counter from this submarine. So those are the event cards. So as you move into these areas, you're going to draw an event card or, or multiple, whatever it says. And then you're going to go to the strategic segment where you're going to make contact, attempt to make contact, and it is a modified die roll. That's all it is. The modifiers, they do a really good job in this game. Let me take you over here as do all these leader series games. Here is your help sheet is what this is called. And here you can see all the different modifiers for contact determination. You're also going to see torpedo attack modifiers, ship attacks against subs. So this is a very helpful player aid that you're going to use uh, as, you, as you play the game. So back to a contact roll. So you're going to roll, con you're going to roll for contact. You're going to add up all of your modifiers. If the sub moved into the region or the map space, during this turn, you're going to be negative three. Not a good thing. If you have radar, you're going to add plus one. If you have, I believe, the special ability that's called searcher, you're going to add one. You might have an ultra counter that came by the, uh, by the play of an event. You're going to add plus one. If you happened to buy an intel counter, remember I talked about that earlier, you're going to buy an intel counter sometimes, and you're going to place it in a certain zone, and that's going to give you plus two during that time, that uh, strategic segment in that zone. So you're going to add up all your modifiers. So if it's right now, if I moved in there, I have plus three. Uh, let's say my sub has radar. I'm going to be plus four, minus three for moving. I'm going to be plus one. I'm going to take a 10-sided die. I'm going to roll it. Ooh, I rolled an eight. So you add... One to that, I rolled a nine. You're going to consult this table, an eight to nine, I will have two contacts. So what you're going to do is you're going to come over here. They have these great little mnemonic devices that you're going to add in. You're going to have two contacts by placing that counter in there. So then you decide, do I want to attack or not and move into that strategic segment? So yes, I want to attack. So I'm going to move you over here and I'm going to show you how that works really quickly. And I really like this system. It's very, uh, very good. And I'm going to actually use some of these already used convoy cards. So I'm going to flip over a convoy card. And you're actually going to turn over two of these. With the first one, you're going to look at the top, which shows you the layout of various counters and their type. E is for escort, M is for merchant, N is for naval. Then it says contact type merchant. You'll see that. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to put two escorts out. You're going to pick up the unknown ship counters, and these represent your escorts, and you're going to lay them out, and then you're going to pick up four unknown merchant counters, and then you're going to put them on the board just like that. So you'll notice that my layout 
looks exactly like the layout on the card. You can check that there for accuracy. So then you're going to draw another card once you get set up. And you're going to refer only to the text at the bottom looking at special conditions. This one says no special conditions. Sometimes they might say rough seas, all torpedo attacks are negative one. It might say for, if for each tanker you sank this time, gain one victory point. Those types of things. Some are good, some are bad. So you're going to draw that. This one has no special conditions, so that's it. Then you're going to, I'm going to take the batfish. You're going to take your counter, and you, unless you have special abilities, you have to set up in one of these long-range areas. So I'm just going to pick here, just for example, this is not probably what I would do, but I'm going to set up there. I don't have any abilities for that guy. I'm going to set up there. Then we move to the movement phase. First off, all submarines, whether submerged or surfaced, can identify any ship zero, one, or two spaces away. So zero, one, two. This is two spaces, one, two. So I can actually identify those right now. So you're gonna draw escort cards. So here, I'll show you this. And I've, I've been playing this for a while, so I've got a ton that are sunk and I've got a ton that are, that are sitting there. So I'm gonna draw the Akuna, and then I'm gonna draw the CH-21, which is a submarine chaser. I'm gonna go over here, and I may have sunk some of those. Looks like I didn't. You don't end up sinking a lot of those uh, escorts. They're not worth victory points. You're really trying to avoid them so that they don't attack you. So there you go. I remove those unknown counters, and I place those two subs out there. Now, when I move, I can also identify ships, or when I fire at a target, I can identify a ship. So I am submerged. My movement value is a one. Sorry, it's getting a little darker. Movement value is a one, denoted on the counter. I'm gonna go ahead and move one space. So that actually gets me within range to identify these. So then again, I'm gonna draw a couple merchant counters and the, and the board's gonna get pretty crowded. This is the way I do it, doesn't mean this is the way you have to do it. But, uh, so I've got the Sakito Maru. Let me see if I can find them. Doesn't really matter, I'm just gonna grab, I actually found the Sakito. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace that one for you and then the other one is the Akebono. I think the Akebono I have sunk. Nope, I didn't, it got away. Darn it. So let me find the Akebono. Here's the Akebono. And I'm gonna put that one, and that's a fast moving merchant ship. So that, that's the end of movement. So I've identified those ships. Now we're gonna do what is called lag movement. Lag movement, once again, is you're gonna identify your fastest moving convoy ship. In this case, it's gonna be the Akebono. The Akebono's movement value is three. Every other ship that has a lower movement value than the Akebono is going to fall back the difference between its speed and their speed. So you can see the Akebono has a three, the CH-21A2, it's gonna move back one space. And you can actually move him there if you wanted to, which I probably will. The same with the Ikuna, it's gonna move there. The Sakito is also gonna drop back one, as is these two ships, which are unknown. Lag movement also affects the submarines. Three minus my movement of one, I'm gonna move back two spaces and bam, look, what's hap look what happens. I'm in the same space as the Akebono. So now the uh, escorts get a chance to detect me. Detection is a fairly simple process. Um, it is based on there are modifiers for the detection rolls, for the escort detections, but they are going to be detected if they modify, if their modified die roll compared to their surfaced or submerged value on that card that's searching is exceeded. So once again, the CH21, and they can do a detection on a submerged sub, it's zero to one spaces away. Let me go ahead and verify that because I feel like that's not, yes, 
If a submerged submarine, it's range zero or one. So he will get a chance to, to detect me. The Akuna won't. Merchants never get a chance to detect. If they are a fleet card, they get a chance to detect, but not merchants. So the CH-21 is going to go ahead and get to roll. I am submerged. So let's go ahead and pull that card up. So look at the submerged value. It says detect seven. So that means the CH-21 has to roll over a seven to detect me. Now there are multiple um, modifiers. None of those are in place now. One of my least favorite that I hate because it's just the way it is. If you have an oil leak, you're gonna add a plus one detect value every round and it's gonna make it easier and easier for those uh, escorts to detect you. So once again, trying to roll over a seven. He rolled a six, he does not detect me. Great, woot woot, I'm okay. So now we move to the sub's turn to attack. Now, had they detected me, actually we're gonna do random movement for the escorts. Had they detected me, they would have had a chance to move in on me and then they would have attacked me. We'll talk about that here in, in just a moment. But I got very fortunate and they were unable to detect me. So now we're gonna do their random movement. You simply roll a 10-sider and you consult the, uh, there's a little table here. So this one's gonna stay in the same short range area. It rolled a seven. The Akuna rolled a 10 and it's going to move into a short range area clockwise. So it's, it's uh, gonna move up here. That's just the way it works. Very simplified system. Until they detect you, they have no idea that you're there. All right, so now the Batfish is going to have an opportunity to attack the Akebono. Let's go ahead and pull the Akebono's card and let me show you what the attack values mean. Now, I am submerged, therefore I cannot use my gun attack. Gun attacks are not really good. They're more of a last resort or just an extra attack when you're hoping to do a little bit of damage. So we're going to look at the torpedo number. You'll notice there are three numbers, five, seven, and eight. Those are the values that I have to do in order to do either light, heavy, or to sink the ship. If I roll less than a five, a one through a four, I'm going to miss with a torpedo attack. If I roll a five or a six, I'm going to do one light damage. If I roll a seven, I'm going to do a heavy damage. And if I roll an eight plus, I'm going to sink the Akebono Maru. And you'll notice this is a huge, huge ship. 10,200 tons, victory points of five, and it's worth experience points three. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now make a decision. Not terribly hard to hit that, but I'm going to go ahead and fire two torpedoes from my stored area. So I'm going to go to the Batfish. I'm just going to pick two torpedoes and I'm gonna fire two torpedoes. Now, the first thing you have to do for each spread, and a spread is de defined as a group of torpedoes going to a certain target. So I potentially could fire torpedoes at all of these. In fact, just to show you, I'm gonna go ahead and fire two torpedoes at the CH-21 as well. That's gonna be a harder shot because they are one space away, which is going to be negative one. I'm not gonna fire at the Akuna because that would be negative two and the chances of hitting that then become less and less. So I'm actually gonna fire two torpedoes at each target. So for each spread, we're gonna go ahead and do a torpedo dud check. And I'm gonna show you this table. I, I wish this was a little better done, but it works. So you'll notice there's a year, 42, 43, 44 to 45. If you have a torpedo mod, so we are in the 1943 campaign. If I have a torpedo mod, I'm not gonna shoot on the 43 campaign table. I'm gonna shoot on the 44, 45 campaign table one year later. If I was in 42 and I had a torpedo mod, I would shoot on the 43 table. That is one upgrade that I recommend for almost every one of your submarines. It's that, that important. So you'll notice, once again, we are shooting on the final table a roll of a one means all tor or torpedoes miss. A roll of a two, one torpedo runs correctly. A three, half the torpedoes run correctly rounded up. Four to 10, all torpedoes are going to be fine. So let's go ahead and make that roll for the Akebono two torpedoes. I rolled an eight, I'm fine. Let's do a roll for the CH-21. 
I rolled an eight. Wow, good rolling. All of my torpedoes are running smoothly in the water and they are going to hit. So now what we're going to do is we're not gonna roll for each torpedo individually. We're gonna roll for a group. So I'm gonna go ahead and move this over here. Hopefully you can see that. I'll move that over just a little bit. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna roll for a group and you're gonna modify your roll. So my torpedo, my batfish, has a torpedo skill of plus two. I'm shooting at zero range, so there's no negatives. I'm going to get plus one for each torpedo in a group over one. So it's each number of torpedo minus one, you're gonna get a bonus. So I'm gonna get a bonus of plus one for my torpedo group. I don't have any other modifiers at this time. So therefore, I have a plus three modifier to each of these die that I'm going to roll, and I'm going to roll two 10-siders. And remember, I'm trying to hit five or higher to do damage. And I'm gonna roll both these, and then we're going to take the highest modified result, and that's going to be your hit. Remember, these are modified plus three. So I rolled, you can see I rolled a one, but I also rolled a 10. So boom, the Akebono Maru is gonna take two direct torpedo hits. I did, actually my modified roll was a 13, so the Akebono is destroyed, boom. He's removed from play, I just gained five victory points. Very nice. Now we do my uh, torpedo attack on the CH-21. Once again, we're gonna look at their numbers. Same thing, torpedo five and higher is going to do damage. Same modifiers, but I'm shooting at a one range, so I'm going to be negative one, so I'm only plus two. So here we go. So I rolled a five, right? Plus two is a seven, perfect, this worked out perfectly. So you'll notice I did not sink the sub chaser CH-21. I did, however, get a seven, and therefore I do a heavy damage. So I'm gonna go ahead and put him down. I'm gonna draw a heavy damage counter, and heavy damage means that they are negative two speed, negative two to detect, negative two to attack, and when I attack them, they're, I'm plus one. So I will put that on there, and it, it was hit and took, um, and took a heavy damage counter. In the game for these ships, two heavy counters equals sunk. Two light counters equals one heavy. Two heavy then equals sunk. So there's conceivable situations where you won't roll as well and you'll have to multiple, multiple times hit them to do damage and sink them. So that's a very simple look at combat. I absolutely love shooting my torpedoes. One of the things I really like about it is you only have, each submarine has 10, the ability for 10 ready torpedoes. You can see I just shot four, but I still have how many ships left? Five ships. So the reality is you've almost, I've seen guys that have played it and they're like shooting three and five torpedoes at everything. The reality is if you do that, you're not going to have a very long campaign. You're going to really struggle. You're not going to be able to have enough torpedoes and eventually you're going to not score well. I like to be judicious with mine, but take a little bit of risk. That's why I felt, you know, two were, were probably okay, but I really like that decision. You only have 10 ready torpedoes and then you only have 14 torpedoes in storage. So one single boat only has 24 torpedoes. So if I shoot two at each target, I'm gonna end up shoot 12 different times at 12 targets. That's gonna give me a lot of sunk ships, then I've still got my deck gun, and then I can go ahead and refit if I have a longer campaign with longer patrols. But that's an example of how that convoy detection, revealing the, uh, the convoy, the different merchant ships, the escort ships, they didn't detect me, I'm going to go ahead and show you an example of combat for them. So when I fire a torpedo, I will place a, an alerted counter into the, the, into the space. And, I'm having a heart, and it says plus one detection. Every time I shoot, 
they're going to have an easier and easier time of finding me. So after that attack, the turn is over, we're gonna go back to the movement phase. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and move here because the chances of him detecting me are probably pretty good. I might as well try to get in his face and, and end him. So I'm gonna go ahead and do my movement of one. Now we're going to go to lag movement. So this is interesting. This guy is now a zero movement. The, the highest moving, there is none. There's a two. And you're going to see that when they lag move, nobody's going to move but me because I'm submerged. So I'm going to go ahead and move back here and drop back. The rest of these are going to be uh, at the same location. So that's an example of that as well. Now I'm going to say he detects me. He goes ahead and he detects me. So they're going to move here. He's going to move two spaces. He can't quite get to me. And then this guy is going to attack me. So let's look at the CH-21 so you can understand how they attack. So I am submerged. So you'll notice he's going to do two light damages to me. Now the damage system is very interesting. Also, I have a, um, the Batfish has an evasion of five. For every two points of evasion, you can reduce a heavy to a light. So I'm, I'm only going to take two lights, uh, even though that's all, all they do. You're going to draw out of this, this cup, I'm going to draw two tokens, and I'm going to refer, they are double-sided tokens, I'm going to refer to the light side. So this one says I take a stress, you're then going to move that in, pull another one, and this one says I am stunned. That's a bad thing. So that's going to make me lose my attack, and I'm going to be very vulnerable uh, in the future until I recover. So that's how combat works. Very simple. Now, the way this combat is going to end is one of, one of three ways. I'm either going to sink all the ships, all the ships are going to move off the tactical display, or my submarine is going to move off the tactical display. So that's an example of how that, uh, that combat system works. One comment I would have about, uh, about the damage tokens is there's a lot of no good ones. Um, Flooding is okay. Stun is very bad. There are ones in there that will give you six stress. That will make it very hard for you to do anything. There are ones that will affect your radar, your periscope, your torpedo tubes, your electrical. Really a cool element. And then there are lasting damage, which is red. And that's going to only come off when you return to a port. And there's also yellow or temporary damage that after every battle... The guys kind of work on it and get it locked down so that you don't have any lasting effects. So really pretty cool system. Uh, there's about 40 chits that you're going to pull from. I would say about five or six, maybe seven of them have no effect. I don't tend to draw those very often, but that's okay. That's just part of it. But I really like that system of damage. I'm not going to show you guys a lot of the other things, but I do want to wrap up my comments by saying... Really like this game. Lots of very meaningful decisions. You can see there's a lot of different cards. So here's the stack of event cards. There's about 40 there. Big, big stack of events. So you're going to run through those once or twice a game. Uh, convoy cards, there's about 40. Uh, you're also, you know, going to run through those once or twice a game. Um, so that's kind of cool. I, I do wish they had more convoy cards, more merchants, and some more escorts. I feel like I see the same ones over and over again. That's probably my only real concern, and that's more of a... I just want to have more of a historical feel and feel like I'm not blowing up the same boats over and over again. Although, maybe that's the case. Maybe they would have rebuilt those ships, named them the Akebono 2, and relaunched them, and you're sinking the same ship. So not really that big of a deal. So one other comment I would make about the different campaigns. So you'll notice here there's an evaluation criteria based on the number of VPs that you earn. So this is on a short campaign. You can see ranging from 28 or higher, you're going to have a great result. 24 to 27 is a good result. 18 to 23 is adequate. 14 to 17 is poor. And 11 to 14 is dismal. And you can see when you get up to the long ones, you're in the hundreds. 
and that's going to take you a while. Now, I did get really lucky. The game that I'm currently playing, I pulled one of those tanker cards that said each tanker is worth a victory point, or maybe it was double victory points, and I think I sank three tankers that time. So I ended up getting from that one battle almost, almost 20 victory points. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. So it has a, lot of, a little bit of luck because there's a lot of cards you're going to draw. But I really think this system is well done. I think it's well set up. I think it is very fun and very interesting. And frankly, you don't have to be a real serious war gamer to enjoy this. If you like historical simulations, if you enjoy World War II or submarine warfare, this is going to be a game that you're going to enjoy. Now, we didn't cover a lot of the other elements. Wolf Packs is a really cool element. Campaigns will tell you you can form one to three wolf packs. Wolf packs are nothing more than, than an accumulation of numerous subs coming out of a port. All of their bonuses are going to work together, and when they detect, then they're all going to attack the same convoy on the, the tactical display. So you're going to have two or three submarines patrolling, and you're going to make short work of all those uh, that, that shipping. Very effective, but you can only do it a certain amount of times per game. One other element that I really like about the game is as you look at the, so let's go back to the, I'm just going to show you. So once again, that strategic map, you'll notice, you know, your ports here, you're going to go into this one and these three fairly often. But remember, when you accumulate these warning contacts, it's going to be harder and harder for you to find targets in those seas. Because if you look at, look at the Empire Waters, patrolling, you're going to pull four events and moving three. Why in the world would you ever want to choose to go in there? Well, you may choose to go in there because you simply can't find targets in these sea zones. I think that's very cool. The game is designed to force you to go out into these areas. There's games where you have to go out here one or two times. And man, that starts to make it a lot more difficult, a lot more challenging, and really, frankly, a lot more rewarding because you're able to defeat uh, you know, the Empire of Japan uh, by going into their home waters. Very, very cool. The other thing I wanted to show you really quickly, and this is just a kind of a neat little element. So here's a look at the Batfish. That's the sub that we were just using. One of the things I like to do, and it really has no bearing on the game, but you'll notice I've lined up all of the targets that they've sunk. And I put the cards over here in a pile and when I'm done, before I have to reshuffle all of those target cards back in, I'm going to write down the amount of tonnage of the freighters that I've sunk. So, for instance, in my very first campaign, I think I sunk with one boat 41,400 tons of shipping, and that was, I believe, eight freighters. Um, you can see this guy shot down eight or sunk eight freighters. Uh, my other sub here has done six. And he's only got four freighters and one escort. But I like to do that. And then when these get reshuffled, you're going to have to take all those and put them back into the kitty. But once again, that's something that I like to do because it gives me a historical immersion and really gets me into the feel of the game. And I really, really like that. This game does a great job also of the different information on the, on the thing. Here's the help sheet. Once again, you almost don't need the rules. Just follow this. Sequence of play is listed here. Very easy to follow this game, and it becomes a routine with your only differences being your decisions. Do I crash dive? Do I deep dive? Do I silent run? Do I form a wolf pack? Do I shoot three torpedoes? Do I run off the board? Do I return to port, etc.? Really great game. Really enjoyed it. I have enjoyed my plays of it. I think, like I said, I've played four times. I would like to sit down and play a long campaign of all four of the campaigns and just see how I do. Uh, but I like to play it kind of here and there, 30 minutes here, 40 minutes there. I think it's a great game. So uh, definitely check out Gato Leader. I also posted a couple of action points on our written blog, theplayersaid.com, uh, last week that identifies some of these different mechanics that I've talked about in a written format with some pictures. It'll help you understand how to play it. I know a lot of times these games... People don't get them because they have a fear. Am I going to understand it? Am I going to be able to get into the rules and understand how to play? I've tried to do those written things as well as this video to at least give you a feel 
for how things work so that you can get into the game and learn it. Definitely a fun experience. I would recommend this game. If you've enjoyed this video, go ahead and like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to learn more about Gato Leader, you can find it on DVG's website. You can also check out on our YouTube channel an unboxing video. And then, as I mentioned, those two written, uh, what we call action points, that will help give you a better feel for how the game works. So I've been Grant for theplayersaid.com. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I will uh, look for some other DVG, DVG games that I can share with you and enjoy myself. Thank you for watching.